Hi, and thank you for joining us today. We have a message that we hope will inspire you, build your faith, and encourage you as we do life together in Him. Welcome to the final week of Conversations with a Snake. We appreciate the opportunity to have shared this series with you, and we're going to wrap it up tonight and looking forward to sharing with you some some very interesting and powerful information that we hope will uh, make a difference for you. I'm going to start off tonight, and then Beth is going to come up and wrap up for us and, and seal up this series for us. Just over four years ago, Barna Research did a survey and they found that 82% of Americans believe that the phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is in the Bible. Over half of the Christians who claim to be active practicing Christians believe the same thing. Truth is, it's not in the Bible. It sounds good. And we hear it from all sorts of places. You do a Google search, God helps. The first thing that's going to pop up, it's going to finish it out for you. Those who help themselves. And there's going to be thousands of responses to that and thousands of returns on that. And there's a lot of people who will tell you that that's valid. But we're going to talk about that a little bit. It's not a Bible verse. And really, the origins of the whole phrase God helps those who helps themselves originated in Greek thought. And then it worked its way into our culture, into the American culture, into mainstream culture, through Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac. It was published there as something that was just true. And it sounded good, and it really bought in to our fleshly desires and our desire to feel like we're accomplishing something important. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, that began a process of us feeling like we had to work our way back to God. We think that we can do it through works, through our own actions. God helps himself. God helps those who help themselves is very legalistic in its, in its way. And it's actually the counterpoint to another lie that we didn't cover this time called let go and let God. We're not going to get into that one because I remember very distinctly just a couple, three years ago, Pastor Bobby on a Sunday night spoke on that very topic, and he did it very well. So I'm not going to go back and try and recreate that or do something he's already done that he did such a good job of. But both of these phrases, even though they counteract each other, they're both incorrect. And they both require something that the Bible doesn't, and that's our works saying that we have to earn something. We have to earn our way. Letting go and let it God may sound like you're not having to do anything, but you are. You're having to let go, and you've got to figure out how to do that and do it the right way. The very heart of Christianity and true Christianity itself is actually opposed to the concept that God helps those who help themselves. Because true Christianity, as we'll talk about, shows that we can't help ourselves. Only God can help us. Only Jesus can help us reach salvation. That's what sets Christianity apart from so many other religions that are out there is because Christianity is unique in the way that we do come to salvation and the way that we do make it to heaven and in, to live in God's presence. You know, the saying, God helps those who help themselves, gives a nod to God. But there's a little trick there that Satan uses. He'd prefer that we never think about God at all. But if we insist on thinking about God, Satan's next best trick to that is let's just get him, let's just get people to think the wrong way about God. That's what he's trying to get out of us. If we're going, if we just have to think about him, we can at least think wrongly about him and that we're not worthy of receiving what he has to offer us. If our enemy can't get us off the subject, Jared Wilson writes in the uh, book we're basing this off, of, if he can't get us off the subject of salvation in its entirety, he will get us to at least think about it in the wrong ways. Namely, introducing just the minimal amount of works gospel as possible. He wants us to think that there's still something we have to do to deserve and work for and earn God's grace. And that's, that's not part of God's equation, but that's part of Satan's equation that he tries to feed us. This lie has been a very effective lie 
for a very long time among some very religious people. It, it's gone from everything to the way you, you, specific way you maybe had to dress or certain things you had to do or not do that were very legalistic. There are some mainstream religions today that still preach a gospel of works and it's incorrect. Actually, when we look at it, God helps those who despair of themselves. The temptations of our life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful that he will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, we're told in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God will show you a way out so that you can endure, that you can survive that temptation. Paul wrote very effectively how we're supposed to deal with temptation. Because so often we think we can earn our way out of, of sin, we can earn our way out of temptation, we can work it out ourselves, within ourselves. But Paul told us exactly how to do that. He wrote to us a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy and the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground. Put on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from God's good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery darts and arrows of the devil. Verse 17 of Ephesians 6, 10 through 17 says, put on salvation as your helmet and take up the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. The armor of God, we live, as we look at this for just a moment, is our only and our best defense against the fiery flames of the devil and the darts and the arrows and everything that he will throw at us. That armor of God that Paul wrote about there is what is most effective and will help us than when we can't help ourselves. And let's notice something as we look at this very quickly about each piece of that armor. Notice how each piece represents not something that we've done, not a work that we've done. Just like we talked about the last couple of times, there's nothing that Satan that can create that is good. He can't create anything that's good. He can't create anything like that. Neither can we create anything that's good. And we can't create our own defenses. they have already been created for us. And if we look at this armor, they're not a work of ours, but they're a work of God's. In verse 13, it says, put on God's armor. In verse 14, it says, the belt that we are to put on is God's truth. Again, in verse 14, it says, the righteousness that can be used to protect us is God's righteousness. The shoes that we're supposed to put on are the good news of Jesus, because we can't produce any good news. Only Jesus can produce the good news, which he did, and he is the good news. The shield of faith is a gift from God to us. Faith is his gift to us, his creation. The helmet that we wear is the salvation that he gives us. The sword, it says, is the word of God. None of those things that we can take up and we could have had up here and a representation of that, but it's, it's not those physical things that man has created. It's what God has created for us. None of those things originated with us, and there's nothing that we can do to create those things ourselves. From head to toe, we are to be shod with the powerful works of God. This is perhaps why Paul begins this whole treatise on spiritual warfare with an admonition. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. It doesn't say be strong in your mind, be strong in your body be strong in your trust. It just said be strong in the Lord and his power because it's not our own. The righteousness that will guard us from the accusations and the devastations that the devil will bring against us 
is simply the righteousness that's credited to us by faith bestowed to us by grace that originates not in us and not about us but through Jesus and the gospel of Christ it's that gospel that silences the arrows of the enemy it's that holiness that we talked about last week that silences the mouth and the voice of the serpent as he spoke to us and as he speaks to us and as he spoke to Adam and Eve that we started this series on. Our goal then should be what? Our goal should be to keep our eyes on the gospel of the glory of Christ. We should keep meditating on his grace and keep reapplying perfect righteousness that is already ours by faith. If you look at Philippians 3, 12 and 16, you'll see that's exactly what the Bible says. The good news is, even though God doesn't help those who help themselves, because that's not biblical that he would do that, the good news is actually that God helps those who cannot help themselves. Have you ever felt helpless? I sure have. And it's good to know that God helps those who feel helpless, who cannot help themselves. God helps those who are in despair even from their own puny attempts at salvation and to overcome the enemy and to turn their life around and to do things that we just cannot do. We have to turn to him for our rescue, for our refuge. Hebrews 2 and 18 says, since he, being Jesus himself, has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. In the sense, to help yourself is to actually endanger yourself. In your own strength, we're just sitting ducks for the enemy to come and grab a hold and defeat us. Because as we talked in the very beginning of this, the devil's a lot smarter than we give him credit for. He's been working this game for a very long time. From from the very beginning there when he was cast out, he's been working this. He's been building an armor of his own. And he knows how to play this game against us. Because we're no match to him without God. But with God we are. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drags us away, James 1.14 says. The way to avoid being drawn away is to draw near to the only one who can save us. Some more good news beyond God helps those who are helpless. I like this. God helps those who help others. In 1 Thessalonians 5.14, The Bible tells us, brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender care of those who are weak, be patient with everyone. That's tough. Be patient with everyone. Sometimes you just have to be patient with yourself. Sometimes you got to be patient with the people in your house, people in your family, the people you work with. But be patient with everyone. The Bible just urges us and, and, and it just admonishes us to do. Psalm 41.1 says, Oh, the joy of those who are kind to the poor. The Lord rescues them when they are in trouble. Did you catch that? What about helping those who are in poor? Because the ones who help the poor are the ones that God will rescue when they're in trouble. That's so important that we hear that especially in days and like we live. Acts 20, 35 tells us, and I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So God doesn't necessarily help those who help themselves. We have to believe, we have to trust, we have to pray. God helps us when we're at our most weak point. He helps us when we're most vulnerable, if we'll reach out to him and cry out to him. Sometimes he'll do it through unusual ways. A lot of times he'll do it through other people. And that's why it's stressed so importantly in the word that as we saw, God helps those who helps others. That's so important that we look for those opportunities to help others. One of the great things about being part of Bay Harbor Church of God is the way this church helps others. Every day, this church reaches out to so many people, countless people in this community that need help. 
it, their help comes in many different ways. There's a lot of different types of help that is offered to people in our community. And not a day goes by that this church doesn't reach out to someone, whether it's right out the front door of this church or through a staff member or a member or someone involved in this church that, that's going on. So I would, I would encourage you today to trust in God, spend some time in prayer, seeking God for what it is he wants you to do in him and what he wants to be allowed to do in you and through you to help somebody. We're in a very troubled time. The COVID virus is going around and everybody you know pretty much has been affected in some way, whether it's at work or home or even, even church friends who've, who've come into contact in some way with it. There's just chaos in the streets of cities of America. There's storms out there brewing right now uh, in, the, in the ocean that possibly may come our way before it's all over. We're in troubled times. The Lord is trying to wake us up. He's trying to get our attention. Now's the time that we can listen to him and press into him. Hear what he'd have to say to your heart on how you can be a blessing to someone else. I would encourage you. If you know of anyone who needs something, please reach out. It may be a simple text of encouragement. It may be a call, maybe a social media message. It may be notifying someone else in the church or the church that you know of this person that really needs some help. So I'd encourage you, help yourself by helping somebody else. Beth's coming up now to wrap up this series for us. We've really enjoyed the opportunity to have shared this with you. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, Alan. God will help you if you help someone else. That's powerful, right? Thank you, Lord, for giving us the strength to look beyond our own circumstances and what's happening in our lives and see the lives of others around us. That's when we're really being the most like Jesus. Well, we started this series a month ago now. We're in week four. We started it uh, by telling you the anatomy of a lie and how the lie happened in the Garden of Eden and the tricks that the enemy used against Eve. He was shrewd. And Alan referred to that tonight as he was teaching. The enemy's been at this trickery thing a lot longer than either one or you, either you or I have been alive. And he knows all the tricks. And tonight we're going to see that his tricks, although they are shrewd, they do not change. He's got a limited number of things up his sleeves. And once the Holy Spirit reveals those tricks to us, then it's our job to fight him in the manner in which we have an example in the word. So in that garden... Eve believes the lie and she and Adam fall. But the good news for you and I is, is that immediately after that, the devil's demise began. In Genesis 3, 14 and 15, it says, Then the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed. And done this means because you have deceived up the man and the woman. You are cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility, or the King James says enmity, between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Even as the devil begins his trick in the garden, to try to establish his kingdom. He begins to marshal up his troops and figure out how he's going to take down God's beloved creation. He knows that he's doomed and that he will not be successful. The devil waits throughout the entire Old Testament to figure out what God meant about he will step on your head. He will crush you. The enemy was able to take out man and to fool man but he will not be the winner. He will not be the victor at the end of this story. And so he waits through the entire Old Testament and he wreaks havoc on mankind. He tricks all of mankind into building their own kingdoms and gathering things for themselves and taking their eyes off the one true God. He tricks people into developing religions that are anti-God and anti the way. And then one day, a perfect, sinless man is born into the world and he's born to be 
the destroyer of Satan. Immediately, the devil wastes no time. Immediately, he begins to figure out a way to kill the Son of God. He tries to come up with a plan, and you've heard it in all the Christmas stories. They sent people out. He thought um, he would use Herod to find people, to find out where Jesus was and to kill him. But of course, his plan didn't work. And I just imagine that for the next 30 years, he plotted and planned and I'm sure attempted ways to deceive Jesus and to kill Jesus, but he wasn't able to do it. He intentionally went after Christ, but Christ grows up and becomes a man. And then guess what? He, he flips the script. Jesus intentionally makes himself weak. He makes himself vulnerable. He becomes, if you will, the scapegoat for all of us. And the Holy Spirit pushes him into the desert. And while he's there, I, in my mind, I can see the devil saying, this is it. This is exactly where Eve was back in that garden. He's going to want something that he doesn't have. Look, he has nothing. He's, he has nothing out here in the desert. I, this is going to be my time. This is when I'm going to be able to get him. He thought it was the perfect time to take out the Savior. Now, why did the devil think that? This is a powerful concept because the devil's knowledge is limited. He's limited in his knowledge. Do not believe the lie that he knows everything you're thinking. He only has the ability to look at what you're doing and what you're saying. He doesn't know God's plan. The scripture says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a good hope in a future. The enemy doesn't know those plans. God knows those plans. So here he thought he knew, but he was wrong. His, his knowledge was limited. He attempts the same lies with Jesus that he tried with Eve in the garden. But with Jesus, he's very bold. He does not disguise the lies like he did for Eve. Remember in, in the garden, he made his lies seem like suggestions, like just common sense ideas. It's what he does to us. He doesn't do that to Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus knew who he was. And he, the enemy, knew full well that Jesus knew who he was. Eve didn't know what was happening, but Jesus knew who it was tempting him. In Matthew 4, 3 through 11, this is the, the scriptures where we hear about the temptation of Jesus in the desert. I want to read it to you. Listen. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, and the devil knew that he was, if you are the son of God, jump off. And then the devil says, for the scriptures say, the devil knows the scripture. We've talked about that in several lies that we've, talk, we've already discussed over the last few weeks. He knows how to take a little bit of the truth and twist it. So he tries to do this to Jesus. He says, hey, the scriptures say he, being God, will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. But Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, because the enemy was using half of the truth, you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the scripture says in verse 8, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus. The devil was defeated by the word. He was defeated by the word. We hear in Hebrews 4, you read in Hebrews 4, the scripture that says, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. When you read the Bible, it's a living, breathing thing. We hear that sometimes about the Constitution. It's a living document. And what that means is 
it's it fits everyone in every generation that has come after the constitution this is not true of the bible there's so much more truth to this in the bible the bible is living and active and when applied to the situation that you find yourself in it is powerful and it can cut through that situation and it can cut straight to the heart of the truth now here are some key things we need to take away from the desert temptation first there are some similarities between what happened to eve in the garden and what happened to Jesus in the desert temptation. And there's also implications for what we go through as believers in our own personal temptations. In 1 John 2, 16, the word says, for the world offers to us, it's, we're, the, we're the subject here, the world offers to us only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. I don't know about you, but I've, I, I have some of these problems. Uh, craving for physical pleasure, craving for what I see, pride in my achievements, pride in the things that I've accumulated, pride in my possessions. I need to know that those things do not come from God. Those are worldly things. So let's look at the garden, the desert, and our lives, and let's see how the enemy does the lying the same in each circumstance so in the garden he said oh look that tree's good for food to jesus he said turn the stone to bread and the correlation to the john scripture we just read is he was speaking to the lust of the flesh the things that our flesh wants and the promise that the enemy is making in those three circumstances is fulfillment in the garden he said look that fruit is delightful to the eyes to Jesus in the desert, he said, you can have the splendor of the kingdoms. And to us, in our temptations, he says, what do your eyes see that they want? The lust of the eyes. And what the enemy's promising us is beauty. In the garden, he said, if you eat this fruit, it'll make you wise. To Jesus in the desert, he said, if the angels will come and they will honor you and they will minister to you, in other words, you're going to be there. You're going to be God to them. Kind of ironic because Jesus is God, was God. And then he says to us, pride in our possessions. And what he's, the promise he's making here is enlightenment. We're going to be enlightened by these things. The second thing that we see in the desert temptation is that Jesus resisted temptation, whereas Eve and often sadly to say us as humans we give in we don't resist temptation we also see a clear contrast between the disobedience of man and the obedience of Christ and we know that Christ was obedient the scripture says he was obedient even unto death over time the devil has become more and more frantic because he's losing and he knows it his time is running out and believe me, when you and I look around and we look out at what's happening in the world and we see all the chaos that's going on, um, some people may say, boy, the devil's really happy at the havoc that's happening. And perhaps he is. But I want to tell you this. He's frantic because he knows that his time is running out. He knows what's happening around the world means the clock is ticking for him. This is why, as we've discussed in all of the lies that we've talked about, lies don't sound exactly like lies the devil makes his lies sound like common sense religious insight or motivational speeches this morning i happened to turn on a little youtube video and um, it was a motivational speech and at the end they interviewed the lady who was speaking and she said you know what i want is just for my experience to give hope and she probably had fifteen thousand people listening to her and while i agree that we can talk about our circumstances that we've been in and give people hope, that's not where real hope comes from. Real hope comes from the word. We must respond to the lies and the temptation of the enemy as Christ did with the word. In Ephesians 4.14, Paul, talking about the gifts given to the church, said, after all the offices are discussed, he talks about why there needs to be an apostle, why there needs to be an evangelist, and all the offices that have been given, he says, then we will no longer be immature like children. 
We won't be tossed around and blown around by every wind of teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies that's so clever that they sound like the truth. Our call as believers, Bay Harbor, is to be mature. And the way believers become mature is by taking in as much of the word as they can and then taking that word that you've taken into yourself and spitting it back into the situations, declaring it back into the situations that come into our lives. We must be grounded in the theology of the word. For every sin, every temptation that we face, there is a theology in the Bible that counteracts it. I'm going to list some of those out for you right now. Now, listen, you don't have to be like our wonderful pastor and go and get a doctorate degree in theology to understand the theology of the Bible. Don't be tricked. Don't be tricked into believing that you have to have some kind of special wisdom or special impartation to understand what the scripture is saying. No, we have the helper, the Holy Spirit, to make the scripture clear to us so that we can apply it to our lives and apply it to the circumstances that we face. Here are some doctrines found in the scripture that combat the lies and the vulnerabilities that we face. If you have doubt and insecurity, there is a doctrine about the ability of the believers to persevere in the faith. If you have fear, there's a doctrine about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us and how he makes us brave. If you have timidity, there's the fruit of the Spirit. You can find the doctrine about the fruit of the Spirit in the scripture. If you are laden down with guilt, there is a doctrine about the removal of our sins because of Christ's sacrifice. If you are facing condemnation, there's the doctrine and the teaching about Christ taking on our sins. We are not condemned because he was condemned for us. If you have a fear of death, we have the doctrine of the resurrection and the ascension. If you have a fear of the future, there is the doctrine about sanctification and the second coming of Christ. If you have a distrust of God, if you just say, I'm not sure about this God thing, there's a doctrine in the Bible to help you understand that. It's the inerrancy and the historicity of scripture. If you are bogged down in legalism and you feel like you have to do things a certain way and you keep messing it up and you're not getting it right, there's a doctrine of legalism, I mean of grace in the Bible to combat legalism. And if you're suffering today with loneliness, there is the doctrine of the church and that we are a body and a family and we minister to each other. And even now while we're having to be separated because of the circumstances that we find ourselves in in the world, there are still people in this body who want to love on you. So if you're feeling lonely today, please reach out to us so that someone can call you and let you know that you're loved and you're an important part of our body and of this church. We must be students of the word. Repeat that to yourself right now. We must be students of the word. You don't have to sit down for hours a day and read your Bible. Although I would submit to you that once you start reading the Bible and studying it and figuring out what it says, your hunger will grow. Your hunger for the word will grow and you will want more of the word living and active in your life. Jesus completed the word and he completed the devil's demise by saying these words when he was hanging on the cross. It is finished. The devil's already done. The liar, the father of lies, he's already done because it was finished at the cross. Jesus could have said when he was hanging on the cross, it is possible. It's possible. It's possible to follow God. It's possible to overcome the devil. He didn't say that. What he said is, it is finished. He could have said, um, it's, it's probable. It's probably going to happen. He didn't say that. He said, it is finished. Because of Christ's death and resurrection, it is possible for all of the things in our lives to be resurrected. All of the things that you're struggling with, all of the sin that keeps entangling you, those things that are choking out the life in your everyday lives can be resurrected through the power of Christ and through the power of the word. The apostle John said in 1 John 3, 8, but when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to, get to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. 
We destroy sin in our lives through the word. If that's what Jesus, the son of God, had to do, then certainly that was the example for us. Paul said in Romans 16, 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The word does that for us. We crush Satan and his plans when we declare the word of God over our circumstances. Now, my final thoughts as we finish up this series that we've been doing for four weeks is that in every lie that we've shown you, every lie that we've unveiled, for every one that we've unveiled, there's two or three more. The enemy has a lot of tricks in his basket. The word is what will make the difference. When you're being confronted by something that you know is not the truth, dig into the word. Find out what the word says and apply that to that situation. We have to hold on to the resurrection work that Christ did in our lives. Because the real truth is that because of Christ, we sinners can go to heaven. And the real truth is because of Christ, the devil will go to hell. Wow, we hope you enjoyed the message that you've just heard. We would love to partner with you as we strive to do life together and be a source of encouragement to you. If you have a prayer request, or if you want to know what we're doing next, or maybe you want to sow a financial seed into the work that God is doing through Bay Harbor, you can easily do so on the Bay Harbor Church app or by visiting our website at bayharbor.cc. We pray that you have a wonderful week, a blessed day, and please stay tuned for the next encouraging word coming your way.